Well, good evening, everybody. Happy Saturday to you. It's good to see some familiar faces and uh, glad that some of you even walked in and were sitting and preparing really quietly. Actually, you guys were really loud, which was a treat to hear you <laughs> kind of connecting with folks. Whether you're here in the room or you're with us online, we're glad you're tuning in. Uh, we get a chance tonight to, um, to make a joyful noise, as Scripture says, as we talk about walking in joy. And uh, one of the ways we get to do that is with our voices. Uh, there's, there's things in the scriptures that talk about clanging cymbals and um, instrumentation, but we're going to use our voices tonight to sing. We're going to hear scripture about uh, what it might look like, how we might um, fall more in love with Jesus, and that might bring us more joy. So uh, we're going to do some um, singing, some scripture reading, some learning, and uh, we're grateful that we get to be a community to do that. Would you stand on your feet, and we're going to make a joyful noise.
heaven come now Let your glory reign Shining like the day King of heaven come yeah, That is uh, the season that we're in The season as we anticipate the coming of Jesus God had a really good plan And his plan was to send his son Jesus to us and uh, this next song we're going to sing, it's called Noel. It's a version of Noel. I have to be honest, I was like, I have seen a lot of versions of Noel. And I was like, I don't know what that means. I don't know what Noel means. And so, <laughs> good old Google, um, I was able to look it up. And it's this Latin word that means to be born. And uh, I was like, well, that works, right? And you could almost sing happy birthday with Noel in it. But it's a new birthday song. But we won't do that. Um, but know well to be born, uh, that God had a plan to send his son, son Jesus down to be born as a human from baby up to man. And that was his great rescue mission to us here on earth. So as we sing this version of Noel, think about that. God sending his son Jesus to be born a new birth.
Amen. Well, it's great to be with you today in worship. And as we uh, gather, uh, we're just really grateful that we might come together, especially in this season as we walk towards Christmas. Uh, my name is Jeff Huber. I'm a lead pastor here at Summit Church. And uh, if it's your first time with us, we have little QR codes in the back of your chairs. There's also online a place for you to do this. And if you just let us know you're with us, uh, we'll make a donation in your name to our food ministry. And it's really critical, especially this time of year. So we thank you for just partnering with us uh, right away as we come and as we gather. And, and whether you've been here it's your first time or you've been here many times we also just want to connect with you and one of the ways we do that here in the room is just by saying hello to each other so if you wouldn't mind would you give each other a greeting whatever way you're comfortable with turn it and welcome folks if you're online once again just check in with us we'd love to know that you're here and gathering with us in worship today. Go ahead and be seated. Um, one of the things we do each week during the season, these four weeks before we get to Christmas, is each weekend we light a new candle. And uh, this week we're lighting our third candle. It's called the Candle of Joy. It's the pink candle, the candle of Mary in many ways. And today the Oshaki family is here and they're going to share a few words and pray for us and light that candle as we continue to worship in the season walking towards Christmas. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blo blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. A highway shall be there and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The prophet Isaiah tells us about the joy of ascending to God's house. The prophet tells us to imagine being set free, being unburdened, being released to live, to fully live in the grace and wonder of life itself, surrounded by those who love us like no one else. And then he tells us that the journey to get there is just as much a joy. We light these candles, the candle of hope, proclaimed peace, and of deep and everlasting joy as a sign that we are those who walk with a skip in our step because we can see the destination and it is pure joy. We are ascending to God's promise. Let us pray. Loving God, it is time to journey up the mountain, knowing we'll experience hope, joy, and peace. Amen. So, so he, he utilizes, utilizes Christmas, Christmas cheer to, to bend, bend space-time, space time, being able to move from, from one point, point to, to another. another. It's, it's, well it's well documented. Santa, Santa, Santa uses the speed, speed of light. And his reindeer is going to get around fast enough to do what? Focus. Focus! It's time, it's time for announcements! For announcements. Uh, and don't and you know, know what's his magic? magic? <coughs> sorry, 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 Kelsey. Sorry, sorry. Anyway, anyway we're, we're so, so glad you guys are here. Welcome, Welcome to Summit Church. Church. Such an honor, honor to be with you. With you. A couple of things coming, coming up here that, that we want you guys to know about. And as always, all this information is on our Christmas website, so you can find more info there if you need it. The annual Christmas cantata is happening at St. Mark's on December 18th at 5.30 p.m. That is going to be our choir and St. Mark's choir. It's going to be an awesome night of music for the holiday season. We'd love to see you there. And just a reminder, we talked about this last week as well, but we do have a few more more empty slots. slots. If you want to be, be an usher, usher or a reader, reader this Christmas, Christmas Eve or Christmas Eve, 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 we'd love to have you. It's going to be an awesome, awesome time. We get, we get to make our church as fun and, and welcoming for people as we possibly can. 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 So we'd love for you to join, join us and volunteer as an usher, usher or a reader this Christmas Eve. Now let's, now let's take a moment and prepare our hearts for the message. The Old Testament is full of stories. Fascinating, true stories that capture the imagination. Brutal stories of war, revenge, and violence. Tragic stories of betrayal. 
and endless stories of God's power, His love and His faithfulness. And every story points to a promise. A Savior is coming. Things will be put right. Don't give up. God gave Isaiah a glimpse of what to wait for. A people walking in darkness see a great light. The war is over. The victory celebration begins. How? A child is born. A son is given. A leader will finally bring peace and justice forever. And so the waiting began. I, uh, I have a lot of ties that I wear kind of at Christmas time, and I don't normally wear a tie, but every tie has a little bit of a story. So this tie uh, belonged to my sister. She worked in the restaurant business for many years as a waitress while she was putting herself through college, and this was one of the ties that she had, and, and uh, one of the days she came home from her restaurant shift, and I said, oh, that's a, that's a cool tie. I'd love to have a tie like that, and she ripped it off and threw it at me and said, you can have it. <laughs> it was a really rough day at serving tables that day, and, and that's kind of the mixed bag that comes with Christmas, isn't it? I mean, today we're going to talk about joy, and I want to suggest to you that joy is something deeper than just happiness. I mean, you can have happiness and not necessarily have joy. Uh, typically, joy comes with a sense of, well, good well-being and him being happy, but, but joy is a deeper sense. We're going to talk about that today. How do we find it? How do we discover it? And, and, and we're doing this as we journey towards Christmas because, because really there's all these different experiences we're, and emotions we're supposed to have as we walk towards Christmas. We're talking about walking towards Christmas because sometimes we're in such a hurry, we miss out on a huge part of the Christmas story in particular. Uh, we began uh, looking a couple of weeks ago at, uh, at Mary, who was in Nazareth, and we talked about her experience of having the angel come to her. And when the angel comes to her, she's she, she's not very excited, quite frankly. She's not feeling happy. She's a little bit nervous and fearful about this thing that has happened where the angel has said to her, you're going to have a child. And we're going to learn today that her immediate response, I, I don't think, was one of like, woohoo, this is an awesome thing. This is not what she expected. Now, eventually, towards the end of her interactions with the angel, where the angel says, you're going to have a child, she does say these words, uh, I, here I am, a servant of the Lord, let it be with me according to your word. But you know what's interesting? Whenever I read that text, I don't sense joy. I sense more of a, well, okay, I guess I have to go to work today, and I'm going to do this thing. And it's more of a determination, if you will. It's not till a little bit later as we talk today that she experiences a sense of joy about this. Now, uh, last week we moved and we turned and looked at Joseph and his experience. And once again, he was the same way. He got this, he got this, uh, well, this word that, that his wife to be, and now they're engaged. By the way, when you're engaged in the first century, we learned that's really pretty much like you're married that first year, and then he finds out she is pregnant, and this is, and he doesn't even get, you know, we talked last week, he didn't, he didn't get to have the, do the fun part of it, you know? He, he just, she just shows up and says, I'm pregnant, and he's like, what? And, and we learned last week, he was going to dismiss her. I mean, he wasn't excited at first. It wasn't until the angel comes to him, but even then, when the angel comes to Joseph, I, I don't think he's even still uh, very excited about it. Matter of fact, we talked last week, he's kind of the patron saint of doubt. He didn't believe the story. He didn't believe she got pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And, and many of you, we know, I mean, I know this from a talking to you. That's kind of a hard one. And, and then we also learned that he still was willing to choose to do this thing, even though it was a hard thing. I mean, Joseph had a really powerful part in this story that we learned about last week. And, and today, now we're going to look at what happens next in Mary's story. So you see, Mary doesn't just immediately go tell her parents when she finds out she's pregnant. She doesn't immediately go tell her, her friends even in Nazareth. Instead, we read this a few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of 
Judea, to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. All right, so Zechariah and Elizabeth are, now Elizabeth is either an older cousin or maybe even an aunt, probably three or four decades older. Mary, we learned, is 13 or 14 years old because that's when you typically would be engaged when you were a young woman in the first century in Jewish culture. And Elizabeth is probably more like in her 50s and has never had a child, probably even had some miscarriages has been, in some ways, shunned by her community because she hasn't been able to have a child. And yet, Mary goes to see her. And Zechariah, Zechariah, by the way, I mean, the poor men in this story. Can I just tell you, last week we learned Joseph didn't have a line in the whole story. Zechariah can't speak when his wife is pregnant. I mean, it's, like, it's almost like they're telling us, just be quiet and listen and pay attention and do what you're told. I mean, that's what it feels like when you read these stories. So here's Zechariah, he can't talk, and, and Mary goes down to see him. And here's what we've been learning is a little bit of geography in this. So up on the screen, you're going to see on the left-hand side is the Mediterranean Sea. At the very top is Nazareth by the Sea of Galilee. Mary's going to take a 10, 9 to 10-day journey as she comes through what's called the Jezreel Valley or the Valley of Megiddo. And then there's three different sets of mountain ranges she's going to have to go over to get to what's called Ein Karim. Ein Karim, we're going to zoom in, is about three miles from Jerusalem and about five miles from Bethlehem. She would have traveled through those major hills. The Dead Sea is on the right. And the reason I want you to see this is this is probably uh, where... Mary, once again, would have traveled. This is some aerial footage of going through the Jezreel Valley from Nazareth. It's what it looks like today. I've walked this walk before with a group of younger people. We did what's called the Jesus Trail. And, and as you go into the hill country of Judea, it starts to get deserty and hilly. And this is one set of mountains where you go up over 3,000 feet. And then you come back down to sea level. And then you're going to go back up another set of hills as you move. And then you're going to go, and as you move through and towards Ein Karim, you're going to go up what's called kind of a final road, if you will. And up this road, there's olive trees everywhere. And once again, you're up at about two to 3,000 feet. And then finally, you see Ein Karim. This is the church in Ein Karim, which is called the Church of the Visitation. It's a place where they remember this experience happens where Mary goes to see Elizabeth. And I wanted to get a feel because this was not, I mean, she's three months pregnant and she's walking about nine or 10 days up over three mountain ranges, about 65 miles to get from one place to another. And it kind of begs this question, why? Why does Mary take this journey? Why does she go this way? And I want to suggest to you one of the reasons she took this trip is because she's scared and she's nervous and she doesn't want to tell her family what's going on. Instead, she goes to see Mary and she's heard that Mary at this point, by the way, or I mean, Elizabeth, by the way, is about six months pregnant. And that's kind of a miraculous thing. She's heard about it. And, and Elizabeth may not have even been, have left her house yet, because once again, maybe she's had some, she doesn't want to let anybody really know that she's pregnant until she knows she's going to carry this baby full term. And so Mary goes to see Elizabeth because she's having this miraculous, strange pregnancy as well. And Here's what I really think is really important about this story. That she goes to see Elizabeth, and Elizabeth's first response is to, in some ways, just embrace her. Say, I'm so glad you're here. And I want to suggest to you that here's one of the places we find joy, especially when things are going hard or difficult. Joy comes when people believe in us. When they believe in us and they, and you know, Elizabeth's first response we're going to learn is to say, oh, I, can, oh, I can, I felt my child move as you even walked in the room. And have you ever been through a time in your life where things were going hard and difficult and it seemed like everybody was just piling on and no one really believed you or believed in you? And then you come across someone who actually you know, says, I believe in you and I think it's going to be okay. And it's like, having a, it's like having a really tall glass of cool water on a hot day, right? It's just like, it just like waters your soul. That's what I think is one of the reasons that Mary goes to Elizabeth because she's the cool aunt who, who's going to not criticize me, who when she responds, I can trust her response, if you will. I was thinking about um, when I was in college at the University of Colorado, and I, I changed majors seven times, and I, I never told my family when I changed majors. Um, instead, I went to my campus pastor, um, and I told he, uh, he and his wife, uh, Doug and Alice, and the reason I did was because I knew their response would be, oh, that's going to be great. They never would say, what are you thinking? 
You know, because, you know, we all have, and, and uh, you know, when I first moved here to be your pastor, uh, Doug and Alice had moved from Boulder where I had gone to college, and they were now in Grand Junction serving a church there, and, and Doug got cancer, and so I went and visited Doug, and the last time I was with them, this is a picture of us, as I sat with him in his chair, and you know what was really awesome was getting and going to sit with Doug and praying over him like he had prayed over me all those years before. You see, joy comes when people believe in you and you realize you have someone who's poured into you and you just want to give back to them. This is where joy happens. I was thinking about all the pastors I've gotten to serve with who've poured into me. Uh, Harvey Martz is one of the ones who I served with right out of seminary when I first started doing youth ministry. I served with Harvey. That's my grandma, by the way, with him at my ordination. And uh, one of the things I was actually, I had actually, I actually quit ministry. I said, I don't want to do this anymore. A lot of different things that happened. And, and Harvey called me and said, you know, I believe in you. And, and why don't you come and work with me? And so I came and I worked with him. And, and he really kept me. I mean, if it weren't for him, I wouldn't be your pastor today. If it weren't for Doug, I wouldn't be. Here's, a, here's what I want to ask you as you're thinking about, can you think of people in your life who have been like an Elizabeth for you? Who are the ones who have encouraged you even when everybody else is saying all the stupid stuff? And they're the ones that you know you can try. See, I think that's where joy comes for her is when she's willing to go, when she goes to this woman who's, you know, 20, 30, maybe 40 years older than her, and she gets this older, wise, sage person who says, oh, when you go to the Church of Visitation, there's this beautiful statue of Elizabeth and Mary that remembers this moment when they met. And uh, there's, and almost every language you can think of is their story is on the, in that language, because this because this, because this story speaks to us in any culture. Uh, one of the times when I was at this church, um, there was a whole group of people from, uh, and I, I wish I could tell you, I don't remember, they were from an African nation, and they'd come and visit it, and they were all, it was a group of women, younger and older, and they just, they just sat there and stared. And they're like, and then they looked at each other like, like, you've been that for me, or you've been that for me. I mean, there's something about this story that makes us ask this question, who's been like that for me? You see, joy comes and is found in having someone like Elizabeth and a Mary because at some point in your life, you're going to need to be an Elizabeth for someone else, right? Because there's going to be someone else that will come into your life that you're going to need to pour into, that you're going to need to care for, that you're going to need to maybe be the one who believes in them. Uh, we're going to... Um, we're going to pray over and bless a group of Stephen ministers um, towards the end of our service. There are folks who've done training to meet with you one-on-one -on -one and to be there. And in many ways, they're saying, we want to be an Elizabeth in your life. Someone who would just walk, who will believe in you, who, who, won't, who won't ask you all those silly questions everybody else is asking you, but instead just pray with you and listen and walk with you. And this is a powerful part. This is a critical part of this story where we all, I think, need to be that. I'm, I think about the number of times uh, I've had the privilege in, uh, of being invited into especially young people's lives. And you know, it's unfortunate as you get older, people like look at you like, well, you're old. Do you know anything about this? <laughs> I've had a couple of people ask me that recently. I'm like, holy, like, wow, I guess I am old. Holy smokes. But at one point, I needed that person who was an Elizabeth. But I also know that as we get, one of the reasons I love being an intergenerational church is that we need each other. We need to connect with each other in deeper ways. I, I really enjoy, we have a lot of younger pastors I try to connect with and pour into because I know it's really hard right now, especially to start in ministry. And, and, and I, I got to go up to Rooted the other night and uh, on Thursday and just see how, um, what an amazing, by the way, you ever want to be inspired? Go hang out with our college ministry. You will meet some amazing, I mean amazing. I would love to tell you, I was there to be an Elizabeth for them, but I can tell you most of them were a Mary for me. They're just inspiring me to think about, you know, where it is God's working in their life and to see them. I mean, it's this powerful idea that's give and take we're meant to see. And in this story, we find joy. And we're meant to find joy in that moment. I think it's one of the reasons we love, you know, having, having children around at Christmas, right? You know, Jesus said something. He said this. He said, let the children come to me, for to such belong the kingdom of God. You know what's interesting? He never said, because they're the kingdom of God tomorrow or in a few weeks or in a month. They're the kingdom of God now. Not only do we need to have Elizabeth, we need Marys in our life. We need, we need all the generations in our lives because that's where we find joy. And we find joy at that. And, and then here's one of the things that we see happen in this interaction. At the sound of Mary's greeting, so, so Mary goes and she greets Elizabeth. Elizabeth's child leapt within her. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, now, can I just tell you that 
the, the, the two of the, actually, in your New Testament, the two first prophets, this is what a, a prophet is, someone who receives the Holy Spirit. The two first prophets are Mary and Elizabeth. Because Elizabeth receives the Holy Spirit and with it gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. And once again, here's this wisdom that comes from this older woman to a younger woman who is anxious, who's nervous, who's fearful. And you know what's really powerful? It's at this moment that Mary begins to understand what she's been asked to do. It's not until someone from the outside verbalizes it that she goes, oh, can you think about moments in your life when you've been wondering, is this where, is this where I'm supposed to go? What am I supposed to do? And someone from the outside, an Elizabeth, someone who's maybe got some wisdom, sees it, and they say it out loud. All of a sudden, it takes on new power. But here's the other thing about Elizabeth. Elizabeth is the very first person to claim Jesus as Lord. Did you know that? She is the first person in your Gospels to say, why is it that the mother of my who? Lord. The word she uses is Kyrios, Lord, King, highest authority, first thing. And here's what that points to, that joy is found when we recognize who our Lord is. Because it's a deeper sense. By the way, this joy is deeper than happiness. You know, uh, it, it, I meet with people sometimes and they're like, well, I don't have a Lord. And I'll say, well, show me your checkbook and your calendar and I'll tell you your Lord. We all have one. It's just first thing. What's the thing we put first? And here's why we find joy with Jesus as Lord, because we realize all the other stuff we thought was our Lord really isn't. How, much, how many times are you told between now and Christmas what your Lord should be? Because if you buy that thing, then you'll be happy. And then you get it, and you're happy momentarily, and then you're miserable again. Because the wrong thing has become Lord. The idea is, is, is that we all need a Lord. We're going to talk more deeply about that on Christmas Eve, but, but joy is found when we realize that we have an anchor. Here's another way to look at this. What's your anchor? What's the thing to hold you? When there's, because at this point for Mary, there's fear, there's anxiety, and she begins to experience joy only when she recognizes that even in the midst of this hard thing she's going to do, there's something deeper. There's an anchor holding her roots down. What's the anchor that's going to hold you in the midst of uncertainty and change? Can I just tell you, has it felt like the last few years have, have been pretty uncertain? There's been a lot of, like, you know, we've come, we're coming out of this pandemic, maybe, who knows, you know. Do you ever, has this ever gone through your mind? When's it going to start up again? Anybody else had that thought? Okay, you know when that happens? When anxiety becomes our Lord. That's when it happens. I'm not saying you're bad for feeling it, by the way. I've felt it. We all, we all get there. Remembering Jesus, the Lord is supposed to go, oh yeah, it's going to be okay. The worst thing isn't going to be the last thing. I'm going to get through this. You know, Elizabeth does this. She says, Mary, we're going to get through this. And part of the reason is because that, that child inside of you, I know what that is. That's the anchor. That's our Lord. That's the one that's going to hold us. That, that's, I'm just so excited to be in the presence of that. And, and, and that's supposed to change everything for us. When you're in the middle of, you know, we have a lot of, a lot of our students, you know, you have uh, finals this week. Can I just tell you, your principal, your teachers, and your grades are not your Lord. It'll be okay. Doesn't mean you don't work hard, but can I just tell you, our Lord is deeper than that. Our Lord is not our job. It's not our finances. It's not the, the family that drive us crazy at Christmas and that we worry about having to go see. <laughs> All right? It's something deeper. This is why this is so important. Joy is found when we recognize that Jesus is Lord and is meant to change everything. And then Mary responds, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he took notice of his lowly servant girl, and from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things 
for me. We're going to sing those words, by the way, a little bit later today. He's done great. And, and you know why that's important? Because here's the next place. Okay, so first uh, we've learned that uh, joy is found when we have someone come alongside of us, when people invest in us and, and, and when we invest in others. Uh, we've learned that joy comes when we realize what really is Lord in our lives. But here's the second thing. Singing leads to joy. You realize this is Mary's song. It's called the Magnificat. And, and, and what we know, by the way, for a fact is that when you sing, it leads to joy. Do you realize that the largest book in your Bible is the Psalms? And that's a book of songs. That's what it means. Psalms are songs and poetry. Those 150 chapters right in the middle of your Bible, which are called Psalms, those were the things people sang. They sang them out loud. They sang them to God when they were sad, when their hearts were broken, when they felt joy, when they felt happiness. When They, they sang over and over again. I think one of the things we kind of lost during the pandemic, while it was great to worship online, how many of you... When you're home, first of all, it's really hard to mix the music and make sure it all sounds good, you know, online. That's not an easy thing. So that was hard at first, you know, on Easter weekend, like it was right after the, and I know people were at home going, how do I sing along to this? You know, it didn't, probably didn't sound as great as it did until we got better at it. But how many of you, when you're in your house, maybe with some other people, the songs come on and you're like, oh, we can turn this off now because none of us want to sing and hear each other. Anybody else do that? All right. I think we missed we missed joy in that sense because joy is meant to come when we sing, when we sing out loud and sing out strong, you know, when we, because, you know, by the way, okay, a little sidebar here. People will say sometimes, boy, the, you know, we, we, the music's gotten loud in our contemporary services. Do you know why we make it loud? So you can't hear the people around you. And so they don't have to listen to you either. But we want you to sing because... Because singing out loud is good for you. It's meant to bring you, once again, a sense of joy. Can I just tell you, some of my favorite Christmas memories are singing Christmas caroling. Um, I was thinking about when I was first doing youth ministry. And uh, one of the things that we would do was we would get together always and we would go to places where people were shut in or hospitals and stuff. And, and, and when I was serving with Harvey at uh, the Methodist Church in Carl Springs, um, like I think it was my second Christmas there, and we had this habit, and so, and I didn't feel like it. And the reason I didn't was because one of the kids from our youth group was had been in a car accident. It's either in the hospital. They said he'd never really wake up. So that was happening. And then one of the other kids in my youth group, her mom was dying of, of a rapidly moving cancer. It was just, and I just didn't feel like going. And luckily, uh, we had a really a student-led ministry, and our student leader called me and said, Pastor Jeff, this is what we're doing. We're going Christmas Carol. I'm like, fine, I'll go. And we went, and we actually went to the hospital, and we sang to Doug, who was in the hus- a Craig bed is what they called it, where he was still unconscious, and we sang to him. And, and then we sang up and down the halls to some of the other kids. This is when you could still go in the hospital and sing to me. And then we went, and we sang to this young woman's mom, and, and, and we sang other places. And, and by the end, my cheeks hurt. I was smi- I had been smiling, and we'd been laughing. And, and even the people who were sick in the hospital were singing Christmas carols with us. There's something about singing that changes us, that brings us a sense of joy. By the way, I did a little research on this. I just want to share with you. And by the way, every piece of research has found these things to be true. When you sing, it, first, it reduces stress. It literally lowers your blood pressure when you sing. And actually, when you sing in a choir, what they found is that people might have different heart rates and stuff, but when you're singing in a choir, within about 10 to 15 minutes, everybody's heart rate and heartbeat is the same, and it's lower. Isn't that interesting? It prevents illness and infection when people sing. It actually lowers your risk of getting sick. It produces a sense of well-being, especially if you're feeling depressed and stuff. Singing changes that. Singing loosens everything up, and it reduces snoring. So good thing to do, sing at night before you go to bed, all right? There you go. It enhances your memory. I can't tell you the number of times I've been to a place, an Alzheimer's clinic or a place where we're struggling with dementia, and we start to sing, and people remember songs, and they start singing. And then right afterwards, some of them will have these bursts of memory of things they remember. It helps their memory. It lists depression and grief. By the way, this is, this is in several journals of psychiatric medicine, by the way. They have all these studies, and it also raises your self-esteem. When you sing, it makes you feel better about yourself. Unless, of course, the person next to you says, please stop singing, you suck. Uh, that doesn't, that, okay. So don't do that, all right? The idea is to sing and to enjoy it and to let it, because that's meant to bring us, once again, a sense of joy. So my question to you is this, are you singing to God? Are you singing to God? Maybe in your car, in the shower, in other places, here in worship, lifting your voice, singing to God. 
You know, the rest of Mary's Magnificat captures this next theme of joy. He shows mercy. She goes on in her song from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and the haughty ones. He has brought down the princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has lifted the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. Here's a theme, by the way, over and over and over in Scripture. James captures this in his letter. He quotes the Proverbs, but we find this text over and over again that he gives grace generously, as the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I'm just going to tell you something. We either learn to humble ourselves or God will do it for us. Uh, Not just (laughs) with what happens in this life, but can I just tell you, if you go to your grave proud, I can tell you death is going to humble you. It just is. But those who exalt themselves, Jesus says, will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. By the way, this is over and over again in this story, right? Mary's from Nazareth. Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? She lives in a town of 80 people. She serves the people in the big city next to her, and she's a nothing nobody from a no-nothing town that nobody's heard of. And Joseph is a carpenter. These are peasants in the first century. Carpenters just served everybody else. And here's these two characters, and God chooses them. And then God chooses these crazy, wacky disciples who are not the people you would think. And over and over, God chooses the lowly because there's something about making yourself available to God when you realize that's all you have, that's what you have, that's your main thing. And so here's what I want to suggest to you, that one of the things that we do to bring joy this season is we learn to live as people who have hearts that are hungry for something more, and we recognize and we give. Can I just tell you the answer to living humbly? (laughs) It's very simple, and that is to give generously. Because then you realize it's not all yours. It's not all about you. What, this ties right into, by the way, that who's Lord? Who is Lord of your life? Because if we are Lord of our own lives, that's what our culture tells us, right? You should be Lord. You're gonna, oh, at least in misery. You want to find joy? Give, give yourself away. Are we hungry? Are we rich? Do we hunger for God? Here's what's interesting. Um, uh, Schwab did uh, a survey recently this last year, and, and they asked people, um, what do you think it took to be rich in today's world? And the average answer was 1.9 million. People said, if you have 1.9 million, then you're rich in our culture. Here's the problem. Credit Suisse, who looks at all of the people in the world and how much they earn, say that if you're in the top 10% in the world, you're considered wealthy, and all you need to have is $68,000 and you're in the top 10% in the world. All right, um, here, here's the thing. The average net worth of Americans is $120,000. So that means that most of Americans are kind of wealthy and rich. By the way, to be in the top 50% in the world, anybody want to guess how much you got to have? $3,000. You got $3,000 in the top half of the world. I think part of our problem is we've got a skewed idea of what rich is. We're wealthy, Uh, We're wealthy in some ways, in ways that now I know it doesn't feel like it all the time. By the way, if you want to be in the top 1% in the world, that number is not $1.9 million either. That number is not even half of it. That number is $708,000. So that's still a lot, and and many in Durango would qualify for that, but but she's in the top 1%. I mean, here's the thing. How do we avoid going away empty? We recognize that Christmas isn't our birthday. It's Jesus' birthday. We see him as Lord, and, and we're willing to give. So every year we give away, um, uh, uh, you know, our Christmas Eve offering, what you designate. And, and, and this year, this week and next week, you're going to hear from, uh, we have four different groups. This, this, today, I want you to hear from two of them um, as we kind of bring this time of thinking about how we find joy um, and, and especially thinking about what this means for us. Let's just take a listen of how, this is how you might, by the way, find joy this season. It's just by giving something that will go towards, towards these groups. Let's take a listen. Uh, my name is Nicole Johnson. I am the founder and executive director of the Community Treehouse. The Community Treehouse is a uh, indoor play place and a parent support center. Um, we have lots of young, young families with a lot of kiddos. We have one child care center here in Bayfield. So child care is really hard to come by. So we have parents studying, we have parents working, we have parents uh, doing interviews for, for other jobs. 
Um, and this is kind of their first time or first space uh, before the kiddos go to school where they can have a little bit of space for themselves or work. And we love the community treehouse because during the pandemic, it gave us a sense of community that we were lacking. You get to make friends with other moms in the community. You can get tips and tricks from other moms. You can meet friends. The Parent Work Lounge allowed me to both be a full-time mom and a full-time business owner. I get to do some parent work time. It's um, undisturbed and my four-year-old can be watched by the child care providers and play with other kids. My kids have three hours to play and I have three hours of work that I can get done. You can still be with your child throughout the day so you don't have to compromise work and being a mom. You can kind of do both. This has been a huge blessing to my family and has allowed us to thrive in this community. The Treasure House was created to take in these abandoned and vulnerable children. It also started rescuing young mothers that had been married off in the Maasai communities. We rescue children that um, have been abused. Maybe their mothers have been put in jail and the Children's Department needs a safe place for them to go while their mothers go through rehab. And so we take in these moms, we nurture them, we teach them how to be mothers. We also work alongside of their families. Uh, we go to court with them, for them. We have a, law a lawyer that works with us in order to bring justice, because oftentimes justice does not happen unless someone is standing up and being a voice for our kids. Some of our young mothers have been reintegrated back with their families in their communities, which is always our goal as an organization because we want to keep families together. For the children that have no families, we would love to find foster families or adoptive families here in Kenya so that every child can have their own family. At the Treasure House, they receive medical care, they receive counseling, they receive good nutrition, they receive education, life skills, and hands-on training. So we're trying to offer them as much as we possibly can to set them up for success. But most of all, we give them a spiritual um, training to know that they are children of the living God that loves them, that will never leave them or forsake them. God says that He is a father to the fatherless, and that's what we want our kids to grasp a hold of because oftentimes they don't have fathers or their fathers don't protect them. And our desire is that they go out and be a light in their communities as they grow. Joy is found in giving to others. You know, one of the things that um, is easy to do this season is to focus on ourselves. And by the way, joy is found in investing in other, you know, you want to be an Elizabeth? It only takes a few bucks to feed one of those kids for a whole month. It doesn't take much. Being Elizabeth means, you know, supporting a place like the treehouse where other moms can come and be encouraged and, and cared for. Here's what I know, this doesn't take much. And it also pulls us out of ourselves. And it helps us realize who is Lord and who is Savior. And, and, and then, you know, we can come here and we can sing about it together and rejoice. And, and then we give. And as we give, we end up living out the last part of this text where Mary says, He has helped his servant Israel. And remember to be merciful. For he made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham, his children forever. Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months and then went back to our own home. So here's what this tells us. By the way, this is an intergenerational story. We have infants who are yet to be born. We have Mary, who's a teenager. We have Elizabeth, who's probably in her 30s or 40s or maybe 50s. And you have Zechariah. You have all of them interacting together. Uh, we did our night in Bethlehem here Friday, and I saw all the generations. I saw grandmas and grandpas. I saw moms and dads. I saw our youth serving our youngest children. And Here's what I want to just remind you of. This is what we're invited to do and be a part of, and this is where we find joy. That's my prayer for you this season. My prayer for you this season is you recognize that joy is found. It's found when we're in Elizabeth or when we're in Mary. It's, it's found in those moments where we recognize what's Lord and who is Lord. It's found when we sing, and it's found when we give generously. So with that in mind, I just want to invite you to bow your heads and let's pray together. God, how grateful we are to you for your love, for your grace, mercy, all your blessings that fill our lives. Thank you for the people who have been like an Elizabeth to us. So, so wherever you are right now, whether you're online or whether you're here in the room, I just, I'm going to pause for a moment and I'd like to invite you to name those who have been like an Elizabeth to each of us. Just pause in the quiet for a minute and maybe name those people in your heart. 
that have blessed you. And now would you kind of simply say this prayer in your heart, God, help me to be an Elizabeth for someone else. And then maybe pause and see if God doesn't bring someone to your mind, to your heart, that maybe God's inviting you to reach out to and to bless this season. Gracious God, we thank you for this story of Mary, of Elizabeth. Help us to remember daily that you're Lord and Savior, and and may that knowledge bring us joy. God, may the songs that we sing this season remind us of this truth, that you came to be with us, and, and may our experience of you as we sing bring songs and bring us joy. Finally, use us this Christmas season to bless others who are hungry, to be generous, to be selfless, sacrificial, to humble ourselves so that we might find the true joy of Christmas in giving of ourselves, just as you did in the coming of that Christ child. God, we pray these things in your holy name. Amen. So before we uh, respond in song together, um, one of the things that we saw up on the screens was uh, singing evokes this physical reaction in us from stress, uh, from smiling. I come and see what God has done. The song we sang earlier, I'm like, are you kidding me? Like my body reacts to that. And sometimes uh, we, I plow through the Christmas season like Christmas day, that's it, that's it, that's it. And uh, the song we're going to sing is going to paint this picture for us. That the light of the world the Son of God, fully God and fully man, came in this little tiny form, the form of a baby, through a teenage girl. And I have to be honest with you, hearing this song this week, I was like, this is incredible. And I don't often get the picture painted for me the way that this song has. So would you sit, take a breath, And listen, before we respond in singing together, listen to the story of Jesus coming to earth to save us. So he 
that very picture <laughs> that the Son of God came in <laughs> a very messy uh, not typical place is why we our whole bodies can react and say come and see what God has done this wasn't just for people back then this is for us now this is our time to stand up and say there's a God of the universe that loved you so much that he sent a little baby down to rescue us, all of humanity. And that can evoke an energy in us that we get to stand, so would you stand, and we get to respond in a joyful way. <laughs> and as scripture says, with all of creation, we get to make a joyful noise. So let's sing this out together. Oh 
the world with truth and grace and makes the nation expectation as we move toward Christmas. Uh, It's a season of great joy, but it's also a season of difficulty and hardship for a lot of people. Uh, Lord, help those people remember, help all of us remember that we can find our center when we hold on to you as our anchor. Uh, Thank you for the simple joy that it is to be in this room together and to get to worship you and also to sing out and make a joyful noise to you. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. As we close today, I want to thank you for your offering. Uh, Your giving is made possible. Like uh, I went to the the Rooted event, and they're going to meet one more time. And it's such an important thing for our students, and you help that happen. Uh, We're going to bless our Stephen ministers in a moment. You help uh, pay for them to go get training, the leaders and stuff. And so, so many things that you do really bless people, especially this time of year. So thank you for your gifts. You can give online. Many of you have done that. We also have places to give as you leave today, uh, some offering boxes. Um, If you need prayer, we will have some folks down front afterwards and are happy to spend some time with you and then our our meditation moments are on our website. I'm going to invite our our, uh, Stephen ministers that are being uh, commissioned this weekend to come on down. There's a a picture of them with their leaders uh, just so you could see all of them uh, that have been a part of that. So come on down and stand down front. Um, We're going to pray over them as we leave today because these are folks that uh, once again are in many ways said I want to be like an Elizabeth uh, for folks. I want to walk with them, encourage them in the days ahead and so they're here for you uh, to meet with you one-on-one and so uh, one of the questions I would ask you as a congregation is this, um, will you receive from them the gift of care? Will you be open to them, s- spending time with you, being there with you? If so, would you just say amen? Amen. 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 Would you put your hands up like this? And we're going to pray what's called the prayer of the Holy Spirit over them and us as we leave today. God, thank you. Thank you that you have come into our lives uh, in the birth of a child and that we're going to walk towards that and celebrate it. And, and God, we ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon these persons who have said yes to, in many ways, being like an Elizabeth or even a Mary at times to folks, to bringing us a sense of your presence and joy. And, and, and God, we thank you that uh, we can call you Lord and that that changes everything. And, and, and God, that we can sing together as we, as we you know, just sang together just a few moments ago that it just changed changes us physiologically, physically, and may also change our hearts. And then God, help us to realize that we are wealthy, even if we feel like we have nothing or or so little that really, when it comes to the world, we are wealthy. And help us to understand and know that when we give generously, it helps us remember who we are and whose we are, that we belong to you. God, this Christmas season, help us to walk towards you, to walk into unexpected joy. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. amen. Go in peace and serve God.